Hello and welcome to ID Talk, answers from an infectious disease expert. I'm Dr. Sean Elliott, a pediatric infectious disease specialist with Tucson Medical Center, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and Medical Director of Infectious Diseases and Immunizations at the Arizona Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This podcast has been created to answer questions from our chapter's members about the COVID-19 pandemic and increasingly about everything else in the world which is related to infectious diseases. This is the week of March 6th as as I uh, st- uh, speak to you, it's uh, Wednesday, March 8th, and the general state of the world as we know it, suggesting still persistent respiratory viruses are here and here quite prominently. In fact, I just saw another patient with the quadrifecta of coronavirus, human metanuma virus, rhinoenterovirus, and parainfluenza 3. So clearly we are still seeing those cases come in in the sort of late winter, early spring part of the year. COVID-19 itself has largely uh, decreased, and we're sort of at the tail end of the mini surge over the winter. And as we talk about in the last time, there are still continued to be sub-variants of Omicron, the Krakens and the others out there, XPBs and the CMMs, etc. But in general, they continue to be mostly a source of mild to moderate respiratory disease and COVID croup, as we've talked about before. So thankfully, really no new news about that. This week, we have some really stimulating questions, as actually as every week. So, so thank you all for sending those. The first one, I'm going to approach with a little bit of trepidation. It's an important question, but it does have some political elements, and that is statements made both by FBI Director Christopher Wray and also recently by the Department of Energy and federal government that uh, COVID-19 and SARS coronavirus 2 may have originated from a Chinese government-controlled lab oops, uh, a lab outbreak. This versus the, I think, much more scientifically and commonly held opinion that SARS coronavirus 2 emerged, mutated, if you will, in nature and then spread through a much more traditional means of exposure in a, a wet market or a market where live animals, fish, etc., are, are sold to buyers. So, boy, how to approach this one. I think, first of all, for those who uh, read the New York Times, there was a wonderful op-ed over the weekend dealing with exactly this uh, question and the situation. And I think the approach there is appropriate. Basically, the tenet of the discussion is, is it possible that a laboratory error or a poorly controlled lab experiment could have allowed a newly created highly infectious viral agent or other infectious agent to have escaped lab control protocols and to infect the general populace. Is it possible? And if so, that should be cause for concern. And the answer, you know, always has to be yes, it's possible. So is it possible that such an event occurred in a laboratory in Wuhan province, China to allow emergence of SARS-CoV-2? Yes that is possible. But there's no new evidence confirming that. It is unlikely that new evidence shall be found, created, and disseminated, in part because we're years past the scene. And also, as we know, the Chinese government has not been as completely open to exploration as one might wish. But regardless, the statements by various security personnel and now Department of Energy are likely following up on this. It's possible, therefore, we should do something about it. And this is very much on the tails of movements made by the Biden administration administration right now here in the States to also clamp down on, on laboratory control and experimentation with highly infectious pathogens. All that makes sense. All that is reasonable. And, and certainly we don't wish to lose any anthrax and we don't wish to lose any, you know, a smallpox virus into the wrong hands. So there you go. That's a possibility. All of that said, however, and unfortunately, this whole question has become highly politicized. No big surprise. I think you all know that. And in a very highly partisan way. In fact, as I speak to you on today, March 8th, the House and the federal government is holding hearings exploring, once again, the origins of SARS coronavirus 2 and the COVID-19 outbreak, and the Republican members of the House have promised to, to rake Dr. Fauci over the polls, thinking that he's been lying to the, to the world uh, of the origin. So, of course, that's not true, and of course, all that Tony Fauci and others in the scientific world have been doing is, is taking a true evidence-based, factual, hard look at what is is the available evidence, both for the current outbreak and also in general, what happens in nature. So if you look at it from that perspective, and this is backed by a whole bunch of very serious, very scientifically grounded, very evidence-based scientific practitioners, the virus itself, and we know this certainly in the now last over three years of, of its behavior, the virus has shown itself incredibly ready and able to mutate frequently and well, and to achieve even further an ecological niche. So now I'm not meaning to imply that the <laughs> 
that the virus has, has acquired artificial intelligence. It's just that this particular virus happened, I believe, as do all other scientists, that this particular virus happened to evolve with a, a very nimble genetic machinery to allow mutations to maximize its infectious and stability potential. This can happen at any point in time. In fact, it has happened. In fact, there are multiple examples historically of viruses doing exactly that. Fortunately, most of the other examples of viruses mutating, evolving with highly infectious potential have been viruses that did not have great survival advantage because they didn't have the exact right genetic machinery to do so. But when a virus does escape into the mainstream, does show itself to have highly infectious capabilities, then we have a pandemic. And this has happened every century. You know, look back to the early years of the Spanish flu, if you will, and other influenza outbreaks as well. Even look to 2003 when we had the first SARS coronavirus 1 mini cluster. That virus emerged also out of a wet market without any concern about it being a laboratory error or a uh, purposeful release by, you know, political elements, which has also been proposed. And yet it didn't have the same high degree of infectivity that SARS coronavirus 2 does possess. And so the first outbreak in 2003 was relatively limited. The virus eventually spontaneously fell back into to the quiet stream. So here in the States, we, we had about 80 cases. There certainly was a worse experience in China, but that's where it ended. And, and it was not a, a three, four, five year pandemic. It was a couple months of extreme concern. And then that was the end of that. So I point to that example as evidence as to other virologists and other teleological based scientists that in our world, viruses can and do have the potential to mutate, emerge, gain an ecological niche, and then either survive in a pandemic form uh, or not. So the vast amount of evidence from scientific perspectives based on what we know about viruses today and in the past strongly suggests that there was no laboratory release, no laboratory error. This was a natural event followed by a virus which mutated to achieve significant stability in our world. Hence, we still have it today. So yes, yeah, that of course, that's my opinion. You're, you're obviously welcome to read the research. I, I encourage you to read research, not opinion based by non-scientific people such as the federal government. But there's my bias again. Whoops. <laughs> anyway, I obviously uh, am not a supporter of the opinion by some that this is a deliberate laboratory error or even an accidental laboratory error. That said, there is, as always, space to take a lesson from the initial days of the outbreak in Wuhan, China, in looking at increasing laboratory safety. And as somebody who did research on a highly infectious pathogen with toxin release, I take very seriously the need to uh, protect laboratory space from allowing escape uh, of an infectious organism. I have great respect for that. And I think we should all be very serious about advocating for continued laboratory safety practices for our safety and, and for that of the community. That said, I, I don't think that's what we're dealing with here in this particular case. Okay. All right. Well, that's opinion. Sorry, a little bit of a soapbox, definitely, but hopefully a, a scientific understanding of, of the rationale for the two different modes of thought. Next question, moving away from our friend COVID-19 into the most recent current scare, and that would be, dun, 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 extremely dug resistant shigellosis. So I think some of you may have seen uh, a CDC health alert network release in, well, actually the week of February 24th, so just about a week and two weeks ago, about an increase in shigellosis cases that had drug resistance. And, and not just a little drug resistance, but these are XDR strains or uh, ext extremely drug resistant strains of shigella. What does that mean? It means actually that the strains isolated are resistant to, and I'll list them here, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, ceftriaxone, ampicillin, and the sulfa drugs. So pretty much every routine antibiotic that one might use to treat a patient with Shigella who needs treatment, leaving not a whole awful lot of really great options, and the options that are available require hospitalization and an IV. The one oral option, which is being used in Europe, not available here in the States. So what is the significance of this? How bad is it? So in 2015, which is sort of the last benchmark, there were no noted strains of the XDR Shigella, and then 2022, and because it, it's a report released annually, we're up to 5%. If one actually looks back at the annual reporting and the release of the confirmed isolates of XDR Shigella, we start to see an increase in 2019 when there was 1% of the isolates of Shigella referenced and explored by the federal government starting in 2019, and then every year since then, uh, increasing a little bit to now where we're at 5%. The other significant epidemic 
epidemiologic change, not just the isolation of XDR Shigella, but also the patient populations in whom it is being discovered. So in our world, pediatrics, we are usually the ones who see the most shigellosis. This is in young kids, it's highly infectious, it certainly can spread through daycare, preschool, sporting events, you name it, but it mostly has been a diagnosis and disease of younger humans, so we get to deal with those. Today, however, the XDR Shigella strains are far more often being reported in populations including men who have sex with men, those experiencing homelessness, international travelers, of course, and, and those experiencing HIV AIDS. So that there's been an epidemiologic shift in who has XDR Shigella into patient populations that are already at high risk for high degrees of drug resistance. So that's the who, and so far only a smattering of a pediatric cases likely with an epidemiologic link to a high-risk patient population whom you might see the XDR Shigella. So what does that mean for the future? Well, unfortunately, Shigella is one of the more promiscuous organisms in terms of sharing genetic material and therefore sharing the potential gene-based resistance mechanisms with other isolates of Shigella and, for that matter, other gram-negative organisms which colonize the gut. So the potential for that 5% of Shigella being XDR Shigella uh, to increase to higher percentages, the chance of that is very high, meaning that we are likely to see XDR, extremely drug-resistant Shigella, in our pediatric patient population and then need to struggle to find a treatment approach. So if that is the case or when that is the case, what do we do? First of all, we need to realize that not all Shigellosis cases require treatment. Yes, we most often consider that because many times these kiddos are sick, febrile, perhaps soft blood pressures or even in shock and, and certainly having very painful profuse bloody diarrhea. So in that situation, that sort of dysentery type of clinical presentation, we are considering treatment. Certainly if they're bacteremic, we're absolutely considering treatment. But for the others who have some or an increase in diarrhea, but they're clinically otherwise well, they're maintaining hydration, they may be able to avoid treatment. We need to isolate them. We need to make sure they don't spread that little gift with others in their family, school setting, etc. But they may not need treatment. For those who do, what are the options? And it pretty much is going to be use of the carbapenems. So meropenem, ertapenem would be drugs which will still have, for the time being, efficacy against XDR Shigella. If or when that goes away, and unfortunately, following the trends of highly drug-resistant and extremely drug-resistant bacteria in other species, that will go away. We'll be left with things like colistin, basically a, a glorified detergent which saponifies the outer membrane of the organism. It also, by the way, saponifies renal parenchyma and kills kidneys 50% of the time. So it's not a best ideal drug to use, but if you have to use it, you have to use it. And then newer drugs such as phosphomycin, in which we have limited pediatric safety data. So my hope, of course, is that by the time we may have to consider use of a new antimicrobial in the setting of complete drug resistance, that we'll have better safety data in kids which to make that informed decision. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, but my plea to you is, should you have a patient with XDR Shigella whom you need to treat and either hospitalize or consider hospitalization, please reach out to your friendly local infectious disease provider so we can collaborate with you on, on making that decision on, on how best to, to approach that. So, alrighty, well, let's, let's move on. Actually, and this is kind of somewhat related, the next question is fascinating also scientifically. Do you think climate change has a direct impact on the spread of antibiotic-resistant superbugs? If so, why? And my answer is, first of all, yes, I do. And there's actually a fair amount of evidence even supporting that, both from what's been documented from population studies, as well as what is known about microbial growth or e evolution. If you're looking for a very nice summary of issues surrounding this question, first of all, you can turn to the recent report from the United Nations for on the Environment Program. And this was actually summarized beautifully by CNN Health, February seventh this year. So we can Google search that if you like it. It's a very nice short summary of that. But I'll highlight the issues surrounding the reasons why climate change is absolutely felt to be associated with increasing rates of antibiotic resistance in our bacteria and actually our fungi as well. So first of all, there's a simple fact that increasing temperatures of an environment for bacteria, for the microbes, increase the rate of bacterial turnover of metabolism and also spontaneous mutations. DNA 
may, of course, in any animate system, whether it's prokaryote, eukaryote, etc., but DNA has a set point at which it is most thermally stable. Increase that set point and you're far more likely to get mutations, breaks in the DNA double helix, breakdowns in the transcription and translation processes. So the potential of spontaneous mutations or errors in the reading, replication, translation, etc., of DNA to RNA to proteins increases logarithmically as you increase the temperature. So if we are increasing even by what is felt to be two degrees centigrade in the next five years of the world's temperature, that is expected to have a deleterious effect on stability of DNA. And in the human body, in human cells, we have a proofreading mechanism which thankfully helps protect most of us from those spontaneous mutations from reaching clinical significance. However, bacteria, viruses have no such proofreading mechanism. So as temperatures go up, bacteria replicate more rapidly and less cleanly with a much higher rate of spontaneous mutations and far greater chances of a successful mutation reaching clinical significance, which means antibiotic resistance and perhaps even greater infectivity. Also, as I mentioned for Shigella, there are other bacteria out there, especially some gram negatives and E. coli is the best example, that are highly promiscuous in sharing genetic material via plasmid transfer, transposons, etc. The rate of plasmid transfer, of, of gene transfer between bacterial organisms increases also logarithmically as the temperatures go up. So simple fact, high temperatures equal greater chance of bacteria evolving to have successful mutations, making them more successful in living, e.g. antibiotic resistance, infectivity, etc., and makes the bacteria more successful and frequently able to transfer those successful mutations to other bacteria. So that's the, pardon the pun, the cold hard truth. It's actually the hot hard truth, but there you go, sorry. So that's related to bacterial specific reasons. Another component though of global warming and climate change is that as we have higher critical events, so hurricanes, floodings, increase in water levels on our shorelines, that is going to have population changes which will increase overcrowding, poor sanitation, certainly potentially higher rates of pollution, and these all have downstream effects as well on rates of infection and rate of potentially of mutation. Certainly overcrowding and poor sanitation will increase transfer of infections between human beings, between animal systems and human beings, where normally infectious diseases of animals do not have tropism or infectivity of humans, it may be that organisms will continue to evolve to break down those known barriers. And so as you put mammalian systems, I'll use that term, in close proximity through overcrowding and then add in poor sanitation, so exposure to feces, urine, etc. and so forth, then the rates of infection transmission will increase precipitously and also therefore rates of transfer potentially of antibiotic resistance. Also, and this is an interesting fact, as we have increasing pollution and increasing off-gassing or I guess delivery of toxins and heavy metals into our environment, all of those have a deleterious effect ultimately on bacterial DNA stability and increase the rates of spontaneous mutations as well. <laughs> They're not really good for human beings either, of course, but those factors all have downstream effects to increase bacterial infection rates and transfer of antibiotic resistance. Interestingly, I think some of you may be aware of the story behind Candida auris, A-U-R-I-S, which is a highly antifungal resistant hospital-based fungal or yeast infection, which has been increasing precipitously in both hospitals as well as now in the community. Where did that come from? How is it growing so successfully? And it turns out Candida auris has apparently evolved to live and replicate more readily at temperatures which are body temperatures. So Candida albicans, like our classic, you know, thrush, as we know, it is certainly a source of thrush and typically upper outer oral mucosal lesions and then and candidal vaginitis, things like that. But the point being not causing internal systemic invasive disease unless the patient is immunocompromised. Why is that? Because Candida albicans grows preferentially at cooler temperatures than body temperature, right? Because it, you know, if it's external, if it's the mouth, if it, it's the perineum, that is going to be certainly not a, a nice warm 98.6 of, of typical body temperature. Candida auris, this new Candida, has apparently developed a tolerability to grow 
preferentially at body temperature, 98.6. That is an evolution supported, of course, by the environment in which candidas are evolving, growing, etc., in higher temperatures. So we can expect just increasing global temperatures to also be associated with organism, both bacteria, virus, fungi, evolution to survive at those same warmer temperatures. This is just simple process of natural selection. And we've seen it proven in real time by the evolution emergence of Candida auris to where now that is a, a high concerning pathogen so far as CDC, NIH, SHEA, OSHA, as everyone is concerned. Then I think finally, and this is still yet another related factor, climate change, of course, is, is threatening growth of our food species, but both you know, animal-based proteins as well as vegetable-based proteins and, and others. And a natural response by human beings when a crop is not doing well, and this could be a crop of fish or of corn or of beef, whatever you want to take it, is to take change, is to take uh, interventions to increase the yield. Typical growth supporting intervention is addition of antibiotics. It is unfortunately quite clear, and we know this from recent history, that antibiotic treated chickens grow plumper, larger, and give more bang for the buck when sold in the store. Similarly for fish farms, which are still yet an unrecognized source of, of antibiotic delivery with aqua culture. So it, I think, is also reasonable to anticipate that human beings will make choices in response to climate change to protect our source of food and other stuff, which may involve additional inappropriate overuse of antibiotics. And of course, antibiotic use drives antibiotic selection, drives multi-drug resistant, antibi uh, multi resistant bacteria. So there you go. In a That's actually a very brief summary of of the issues involving climate change, which absolutely have a direct impact on further evolution of antibiotic resistant superbugs. So what we see now, I think, is going to become the tip of the iceberg, and we still have the opportunity to act now, of course. And I know all of us listening to this podcast, and certainly myself, advocate strongly for anything we can do to reduce the impact of global climate change. And yet, you know, we are just a couple voices in the wilderness needing to make those voices better heard. So yeah, hopefully that'll work. We'll see. Last question. Yeah, again, this is the fabulous questions. This is a practice that has been vaccinating their patients for HPV, so human papillomavirus vaccine, starting at the age of nine, and they've seen great results in terms of vaccine uptake, which is fantastic. And the questioner says, was recently reading an article about this, which also stated that routine HPV vaccine rates could be improved if more children were vaccinated earlier. Do I think the age to administer the HPV vaccine will be lowered to encourage HPV vaccines to start at age nine? So, with the recently released vaccine schedule for birth through 18 years via American College of Immunization Practices, ACIP, and the CDC, you will note this year, as in past years, that HPV vaccine is recommended starting at age 11, but there's a nice little shaded slash yellow zone where it says it can be administered starting at age 9. So to the questioner's point, yes, we can immunize being at age 9, and in now increasing evidence, both population well uh, based as well as MMWR, and certainly through the AAP, we have found that immunizing earlier has greater success rates of both vaccine recruitment and addressing issues of vaccine hesitance. HPV vaccine, I think you all know and have experienced, is a loaded topic, you know, depending on one's patient population, ranging from the, I don't like it, it's experimental, to it's a sex vaccine, to I'm sure you can all come up with many other examples of vaccine questioning specific to the HPV vaccine. However, those practices and, and certainly colleagues with whom I, I've discussed the issue who are vaccinating just as this is what we offer today at age nine, and that's what we're going to do, who offer HPV vaccine at age nine have encountered far less vaccine hesitancy than many who have offered it beginning at age 11. And in part, it's billed as just part of routine vaccination practices. In part, there's also the ability to bill it as an anti-cancer vaccine, which of course is, is the, the true reason for HPV vaccination. And the ability to sort of protect against emerging risks of cancer beginning with the age of sexual maturity is easier to administer at age nine. So all the reasons are there. I don't have any personal insight into why ACIP and CD 
CDC have, have not just officially lowered the recommended age to age nine. I imagine, though, those same issues of vaccine hesitancy and some politicization of, unfortunately, vaccine schedules may be coming into play. I think it should be lowered to age nine. Absolutely, I encourage all of us to offer or even expect our patients beginning at age nine to get to start the uh, HPV vaccine series. I think it's a great idea, and certainly the evidence would suggest that it's far more successful that way. So that's as best I can do to answer that question. I, I certainly think it's a wise idea to move forward with that. So great questions once again. As always, thank you for listening to ID Talk. Arizona AAP members can submit questions for future episodes to COVID at azaap.org. Um, the Arizona AAP would like to acknowledge the generous support of this podcast by the Arizona Department of Health Services through the Title V Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant funding. For more information and resources related to COVID-19 in Arizona, uh, or to learn how to become a member, please visit us at azaap.org. And in the meantime, and as always, hang in there, keep fighting the good fight, keep those questions coming, and thank all of you for your service.